Good morning, everybody. What is it today? Wow. November. That's insane. November 3rd, 2022. I cannot believe that we are already in November, but apparently we are. Okay. It's the Ask Me Anything. <laughs> Been on a bit of a hiatus the last week after doing broadcast for the Rogue Invitational and traveling and all that, so it was a long week. And, uh, I was exhausted. Didn't even do, you know, any of the events. Just worked out in my hotel room and I was exhausted. The athletes must feel like death. But anyway, yeah, so didn't do an AMA last week. We're back. We've got some great questions. Really great questions, actually. And I guess I should just start because there's so many good ones. I want to see how many I can get through before the baby wakes up. The baby is still asleep, which is good because it's 5.46 in the morning. So hopefully she sleeps at least another 45 minutes. Let's go. First most upvoted question is from Ashley S. Favorite events and moments from the Rogue Invitational. Okay, cool. Um, I mean, easy one right off the bat. I actually get to meet so many members of the Lynchpin community in person, which was awesome. So many different people came up, said hello, and depending upon if you know, the camera was about to click on for broadcast. It was a, a, a quick handshake and a high five. And if it was between shoots when I had some time, there was plenty of just hanging around, talking, shooting the breeze, talking about life in general, learning about everybody. It was really, really cool. So it would make me very happy if this happens again next year. It was great to meet everybody. And I also didn't realize I'd meet so many people. I brought a fair number of linchpin patches, the highly coveted Velcro patches. And I just figured when I saw a linchpin member, it would be a nice thing to give them. I brought a, a decent amount because I didn't know, you know, because some people said that they were going to be there. But, you know, they either mentioned that in the private Facebook group or they mentioned that in the BTWB squads feature. So I thought I had an idea as to how many people were going to be there. Uh-uh. No, there was obviously a whole bunch of people that were just there. I even saw somebody in the um, airport when I landed in Austin, just randomly. I wasn't even going to the invitation, just some random business person going by, stopped me, said hello, gave them a patch. So it was very, very cool to see everybody. Um, let's see. <clears throat> and then actual stuff from the Rogue Invitational. That was cool. <sighs> Let's see. Well, first of all, it's cool seeing a bunch of just old friends, so to speak. People that I don't get to see too too much anymore. That maybe unless you're a CrossFit historian, some of these names might not even make sense. But you know, I get to see. First of all, I was hoping I get to see Sam Briggs, and I did. I was very happy about that. I got to stop and chat with her for a while. Chris Clever, Becca Voigt, Josh Everett, Miko Salo. Got to see Spiel and Bridges. All those you know, just good people. Got to see Adrian Bosman. As funny as that is, even though Boz and I do the Very Not Random podcast every week, we're in different geographical locations. I don't actually get to see him in person too frequently, but he was there. And so we get to hang out and just shoot the breeze a bit. It was really cool. And I was giving him a hard time. You know, he was like a rock star wherever he went. You know, he was just getting... Uh, mobbed by people for pictures, so I couldn't help but just uh, harass them a little bit. I got to see the BTWB crew, which is awesome. They, you know, they had a, a, a section in the Rogue Tent where they were showing the world Tempest, which is just, anyone who's already used it knows it's a game changer. If you don't know what that is, you can find it on the BTWB YouTube channel, but it's in beta right now, but it's basically some features through the BTWB app that you can race anybody in a workout anywhere in the world live and see <clears throat> where each person is. And they had this on display showing people and rightfully so people were blown away. Or you can like race people's ghosts. So for example, if somebody had a workout they posted two years ago or yesterday and you want to race against them, you can call it up if they did it on Tempest and race them. And it's it just, anyway, there was some really cool stuff that happened in the Invitational. It was a blast seeing all the strong men is always just, I'm not the world's biggest guy, I'm 5'8". Seeing some of those people, holy cow. That 
uh, Half Thor, that dude, you know, from Game of Thrones, was there as well. Whatever he is, 6'8", 6'10", 350 pounds or something. You know, he was in the area where I would eat food or whatnot, so I, you know, would walk by him and just, you know, the sun would get blocked out. So there's some, it's, it's a pretty good time at the old Invitational. Okay, moving on to the next most, well, I, let, me, let, me, let me take a look at the leaderboard real quick and just uh, and just see what jumps out at me. Madero's incredible, and not just incredible, but he didn't make it easy on himself. There was no cruising to victory. He had to fight and claw and had the lead, lost the lead, had the lead, lost the lead. So he had to hang in there both physically and mentally, and he did, and that's pretty darn impressive. And he didn't get rattled on that final event, event number 10, the heavy clean and jerks. There were some people off to the races. Even with 10 reps left, he was not on the final platform. And it looked like he might have messed it up and was going to lose the lead. But he obviously, he and his coach knew his pace and they stuck to his game plan, stuck to his pace, didn't get caught in a foot race that they were going to lose. And some other people did and he cruised to victory. So I was very impressed with that poise and composure as well. Vellner had a chance there at the end, and I gotta give Pat Vellner credit. He fell off the podium, right? He, he wound up finishing in, in fourth by just 10 points. Um, I don't have all this committed to memory. I'm looking at the leaderboard right now, the 10 point thing. But I gotta give Vellner credit because he had to go for broke in that final event if he wanted to cling to a podium spot because he knew how many people were strong and talented with the clean and jerk in that final event and it could have shifted the leaderboard around. And he went for broke and his pace cost him. I mean, he rode that line so much that he had a couple of misreps in there, but he left it all out there on the competition floor. And so hats off to him. Jeff Adler, beast, and then Watching Roman Kretikoff go back and forth, that guy's the real deal. He's hysterical, and I love his interviews. I think he's fantastic. He just talks a little bit of junk, and I think it's great. And I'm so happy for Chandler Smith in second place. Big Chandler Smith fan. It's fantastic. And, yeah, he, he, he earned it there, so good to go. All right. Um, let me switch divisions to the women's division real quick. Laura Horvath, I mean, she went on a tear. She had a couple bad events, which we'll talk about in a second because it's one of the uploaded questions. But, I mean, she went on a tear event three, four, five, and six on those individual events. She took first place, first place, first place, first place. Are you kidding me? And then on event seven, took second place. I mean, she, she had a couple bad events, and then she absolutely was so dominant in others so she she demolished it uh let's see annie thor's daughter just so astonishingly consistent year after year uh you know one of the icons of our sport can do it all incredibly impressive emma lawson in third place 17 years old Are you kidding me she's a high school student she took third place at the rogue invitational against all of these women who are full-time athletes. She's a high school student. She took third. The future is here, right? So and then Ellie Turner tied with 670 points, tied Emma Lawson, and Ellie Turner's in fourth. And Ellie Turner appears to be an up-and-comer as well. She's sponsored by BTWB. And she is a strong, capable athlete out of Australia. She trains with Justin Medeiros on a regular basis. And then you've got the list going down after that. Gabriela Magala, Amanda Bar Barnhart, Cara Saunders just demolished <laughs> the heavy clean and jerks. So it was a really cool, really cool weekend. All right. Next most upvoted question is actually specifically about Laura Horvath. Let's see who asked that. Steve M. Related to a discussion earlier this week, what do you think is Laura Horvath's main problem with handstand push-ups at her level? She is likely putting in the time and effort to improve them, but is getting nowhere fast. Yes. Okay. Quite true. So, I have to agree with your assessment that undoubtedly, she's got Ben Smith as a coach. 
Okay, Ben Smith is awesome. And Ben Smith is capable, intelligent, credentialed, the whole nine yards. He knows what he's doing. And without question, he is aware that Laura is not good at handstand push-ups. She's aware. Undoubtedly, they are working on it. Undoubtedly, they have called in specialists or whatever it happens to be. And yet the deficiency remains. So it's a great question, and, and I'm not sure, but I don't think it's for lack of effort. Okay. I also think handstand push-ups are a unique beast because you can have people that are good at strict pressing, push press, push jerk, and you get them inverted and things change a little bit. You can have people that smash handstand push-ups. You put them on their feet and put a barbell in their hands and they're not as dominant as they were upside down. So all of those things come into play and that's just regular handstand push-ups, kipping. Then you say the handstand push-ups are strict and that makes it even more of a niche kind of a deal. Then you say it's strict and it's deficit. I mean, now we are multiple levels into a niche movement and for whatever reason, this is the flaw in the system with Laura Horvath, and I don't know why it's occurring. You know, I haven't had the ability to study her that closely, and even if I did, I might not find out why it is. Uh, but I'm sure that they're working on it. And if she doesn't, if she doesn't fix it, and this is not a character flaw against her. Okay, this is just having a a truthful conversation. If she doesn't fix it, then the chances of her beating somebody that doesn't have that sort of massive deficiency are very low. Now remember, again, I'm not taking anything away from her victory, so please know that. She's a, she earned it, she's amazing. But we didn't have Tia Claire Toomey in the field, and we didn't have, um, who am I forgetting? Mal O'Brien in the field as well, right? Though, you know, so would that have changed the leaderboard? I don't know, but it doesn't matter. They weren't there, they chose not to compete. So your champion is your champion, earned. But at the same time, Annie Thor's daughter's there, and Annie Thor's daughter can do anything. Doesn't really have too many deficiencies at all, right? Like you can easily point out one of Laura's deficiencies. And Laura beat Annie. Even Annie being so consistent was not enough to overtake Laura. So what that means is if you are going to have at least in the competitive realm, right? And I guess this applies to maybe some garage goers as well. If you're going to have a significant flaw or deficiency or weakness compared to your peers at whatever level it happens to be, then what you need to have is absolute home run potential on some other events to make up for all the points that you're going to lose when you punt one in, into the stands because that deficiency event came up. And that's what we saw with Laura, right? I mean, I just said she had four events in a row where she took first place, first place, first place, and that could make up for a 14th on event number two, a 19th on event number eight. She had those points to give up. That's a very stressful way to compete when you know you're going to hand those points over. And that's what makes it interesting that somebody like Tia or Mal was not there because the more athletes in the field that don't have deficiencies, it is more separation and they gobble up more points. And then even if Laura hits home runs, she may not have made up enough points because Tia and Mal and some other athletes may have, you know, grabbed some more of those points. But with those gone, she just had to worry about staying ahead of, for example, Annie Thor's daughter. So everything changes, the dynamic changes a little bit. But if you're going to have some holes in your game, well, Ideally, you don't, right? I'm sure any games athlete would prefer that. But if you do, you need to be able to knock some ones out of the park. And we see that every now and then with, with other athletes that, I hate to use the word deficiencies, right? Because they're competing at the invitation of the games. They're incredible, but you know you know what I mean. And they make up for in other ways, whether that's Noah Olson. Somebody might say that with Vellner, you know, with, you know, whatever, running or swimming or like that, but not so much with Vellner. He's, he's pretty darn well-rounded. Danny Spiegel, right? I mean, the heavy stuff comes out and she is off to the races and you're not going to catch her. She's going to crush things. 
but she has some other areas that aren't quite up to pair uh, up to par there so she makes up some points here she gives up some points there that's a tough way to get on the podium it can be done but it's a tough way and that's physically speaking some athletes have a mental side of the house that gets in their way every now and then so it just depends I mean, look at Jeff Adler. <clears throat> Jeff Adler is so strong, it is ridiculous, ridiculous. And, you know, he smashed that final heavy clean and jerk, which, you know, everyone knew that he would. I didn't think he would overtake first place, which is why he wasn't, like, in the chatting about that. I thought there'd be a great race with Chandler Smith, which there was. But if you remember, not all strength translates to everything because here's a funny story. What event was it? It was, ah, I can't remember what event it was, but it was the event where they did the ground overhead with the strongman log, okay? And, you know, we're making our predictions beforehand on camera, and Jeff Adler has, like, one of the biggest deadlifts and clean and jerks and all of that in the field, so, you know, we haven't seen these people move the log yet, so it's kind of an unknown. So I'm making predictions off of that. And so I said, you know, watch Jeff Adler. He'll, he'll do pretty well. He did not do well. <laughs> he did not do well at all. And what was funny is, you know, sometimes you'll have, if an athlete doesn't do well, man, they're people, right? They, they usually just won't say, hey, I did terrible on that. They'll make excuses. They'll shift the blame or whatnot. They're human beings. But what was great was he did not do well in the clean and jerk, the log clean and jerk. We're going on camera <clears throat> later for like for the next show after that just went well and you know my prediction didn't you know Adler didn't pan out and I see Jeff's coach approach me Carolyn and I'm like oh hey how are you we chat and I love it just it was funny it was blunt and she goes Jeff is not good with the odd objects <laughs> I was like yes I know that now thank you <laughs> but I love the fact that she was just so blunt with it like barbell great. Odd objects, Jeff is not great. I was like, that's cool. I like that. I appreciate that. So good stuff. All right, moving along to the next most upvoted question before my baby wakes up. Oh, this is from Forrest. Forrest H says, if you could program a wheelhouse workout for you that you think you could be 90th percentile or above on BTWB, what would it be? Whew. I'll tell you what, that's a tall order, my friend. 90th percentile? Yikes. There are so many beasts and animals out there that I would struggle to do it. However, through divine intervention or something, I actually got one recently. It, it blew me away. And now maybe more people have done the workout and it slipped. I should go back and check on it. But at the time, that day when I posted it, uh, it was, I don't know, a couple weeks ago, I got a 92 percentile on a workout. And that was the workout that we did at Lynchpin that was 15, 12, 9, 6, 3 reps for time of a 185-pound front squat and chest-to-bar pull-up. I don't know. Somehow... I don't know how I pulled it off, but I pulled it off. And I think that's because that front squat loading, I could just move at a good pace. I had to break up the chest of our pull-ups, but I think my ability to move the front squat saved me a bit. But that was a nasty one. I don't know how I did that, but that was it. But the 90s, I don't see the 90s too often. Most people don't. That's why it's 90th percentile. If I get something every now and then in the 70th percentile, I'll go in the backyard and shoot off fireworks. All right, let's see. Next one from Sebastian C. For all of us programming geeks, I just heard the very not random number 82 on how to program workouts. I thought that the theoretical template for CrossFit's programming would be addressed, but was surprised to hear it not mentioned. Maybe it gets laid out on the weekly scheme, but it was not discussed in the podcast. Do you take the theoretical template as part of your programming? Or is it ingrained in your programming DNA that it just comes out naturally, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the theoretical template, you know, it's an article that uh, Greg Glassman wrote many, many years ago. I can't remember what year, but back in the old CrossFit Journal. 
and it is named appropriately. It's a profoundly useful document, and anyone interested in programming, read it for sure. But it is called the theoretical template and not the factual template for a reason. It is, to some degree, exactly what Bosman and I just did with VNR number 82. It's just, uh, it's ideas, it's a path, it is a template, it is a springboard for ideas for anyone interested in the topic that doesn't quite know where to even start, how should I organize my thought process, what's a good rough road map that I can follow for a while until I develop my style, until I massage it or tweak it a little bit. It's exactly what it is. It's the whole art versus science thing. And so it's a, it's a wonderful thing and it's in there, but it's not... Um, yeah, again, it's exactly why it's entitled not the factual only way to program work as it is it is just simply food for thought to get your brain engaged and get you on that path and learning and thinking and exploring and experimenting and it's great very useful tool for sure and you know what which is true and what greg always said is you know he's going to put all this information out there and it's wonderful incredible meaningful impactful information but he always believed that true innovation in the future would come from us, from the community. As more and more people played and experimented, that was what was going to make CrossFit so incredible and almost unbeatable because it's decentralized. It's just always evolving. and It's a fantastic thing. So definitely if you are a programming geek, check out Very Not Random episode 82 that just got posted yesterday all about programming. It's about an hour long and it's part one because next week on next Tuesday, part two will come out. So we took a deep dive, you know, rabbit hole stuff down programming. People are always asking me to just really dive into my process. And, you know, I told Adrian, like, look, let's do it. Let's go down the rabbit hole and lay it all out so people can really enjoy it and hopefully learn from it. So I hope you enjoy it. Okay, let's see. Next most upvoted question is from Will S. Ooh, I really like this one. Really like this one. Will S. this question. Of the 10 general physical skills for the general population and as they age, how would you rate the 10 general physical skills in order of importance, or would you even rate them, with respect to the sickness, wellness, fitness continuum? Awesome awesome question. So this is a great question and it's also a tough question trying to pick some of the 10 general physical skills that have potentially more importance than others especially as we age. The easy answer you know and it's not trying to wiggle out of the question the easy answer is all of them that I would pick all of them and that's that's the truth I would pick all of them and luckily this can be done those aren't just empty words not only can we prioritize all 10 and continue to develop all 10 as we age? We are doing this. So that's fantastic. So that should make everyone really, really happy. But in keeping with the spirit of the question, I will gravitate towards a, t a couple and you know, quote unquote, give them a bit more emphasis so I don't just leave you with the all of them answer, even though that is what we're doing. And I will answer it specifically thinking about as people get on in years. I would say strength, because just in general, as people get older, they, they lose some muscle mass, they become a bit more feeble. So strength for sure. Flexibility would be a big one. Generally, as the decades creep on, the joints become a bit more creaky. Range of motion tends to decrease. So keeping your range of motion as ample as possible for as long as possible would be a wonderful thing. And then finally, the neurological components. Those last four, coordination, accuracy, agility, and balance. And I'll tell you what, those might take the cake. They're all important, like I said before, but the coordination, accuracy, and agility, and balance, especially as you age, 
for so many people, sadly, those just go out the window and they just decline at a precipitous rate that is simply unacceptable. And that's because people stop doing complicated things. People might stop doing complicated things in their 30s or 40s, but there's certainly not a lot of people in their 60s, 70s, or 80s doing complicated things. And that's the goal, to keep doing complicated things that challenge your brain and make you think about how your body's moving and engage your central nervous system and make it work. Keep making it work as the years go by. Do complicated things. Do hard things. Now, that doesn't mean snatching and handstand walking. I'm not saying somebody that's 75, that's what I mean by doing hard things and complicated things. Like, all right, Grandpa, kick up into the old handstand again. Snatch body weight. That's not what I'm talking about. Complicated and hard things are, are relative, right? You have to say compared to what? First of all, most people are sitting on the couch. So doing anything would be mentally engaging. But if we think about even some of the more quote unquote simple movements that we do in CrossFit that are potentially realistic to be doing for a really long time, they are complicated compared to their non-functional single joint machine based Globo Gym counterparts. They do require you to think and keep your brain engaged as your body moves. They are compound, meaning multiple joint. They are functional. They are power producing movements. That's the goal as you get older, to keep that coordination, accuracy, agility, and balance. Functional movements, and I'm talking air squats. If you're doing air squats and you're in your 60s or 70s, you're doing complicated, keep your brain engaged, functional movements. Way more than the leg extension and the leg curl, I'm here to tell you. Your brain is active. You need balance in an air squat. Deadlifts, proper sequencing of events, total musculature, head to toe, brain engaged, right? And air squats and deadlifts in the grand scheme of all the different movements are simple compared to things like ring muscle ups, handstand walking, and snatching. And so it is very reasonable to think that a lot of people could do air squats and deadlifts for a very long time in life, and it would serve them infinitely better than any of those machine-based movements that don't require midline stabilization, that you can just sit there and tune out as your some single joint of your body moves through a predetermined range of motion that you're not controlling. So right off the bat, we're doing fantastic. Kettlebell swings, you know, and of course all of this loading dependent. Hang power cleans, power cleans, rowing on a concept two rower, light thrusters or moderate thrusters or dumbbell thrusters, or whatever, single unders, even if the double unders go away, whatever it happens to be, all of those would serve you very, very well. And just think of like the dot drills that we put in, you know, the agility drills that we put in a few times a week at Lynchpin. Imagine just if your grandparents did those, now you wouldn't want somebody who's never done them to just literally just start doing them, you know, crawl, walk, run approach, but you're doing hopping, forward, back, left, right, both feet, single leg. The coordination, accuracy, agility, and balance required just for those who haven't even worked out yet, we're just doing an agility drill, would be so beneficial and mission critical as people age. I mean, talk to any physician or physical therapist that deals with an older population and you're going to hear about falls um, being an absolute horrific thing that they see on a regular basis and a lot of that is it's lack of balance it's shuffling your feet it's decreased range of motion and if somebody does start to fall well they're feeble you know they've lost muscle mass bone density and so their ability to recover from a fall or brace for impact is also terrible because they're frail so we don't want to have any of that. We want to be strong, fit, healthy for as long as we can, and we want to have great balance, coordination, all the whole, you know, the whole nine yards. So keep using your body, whatever phase of life you're in. I would say that's the that's the important part. So yeah, that's it. Uh, let's see. Okay. So wonderful, wonderful, wonderful questions. Great to be back chatting with everybody. And I guess I'll just touch real quick on the upcoming challenge for November. I can't believe that we're in November. 
So it's going to be linchpin test number three. Everybody will be happy to learn again that there is no running in linchpin test number three. And people will love the fact that there's a heavy barbell. They may not like the fact that there's handstand push-ups, but they'll like the heavy barbell. This is linchpin test number three, so if anyone's unfamiliar with it, every month we're doing a challenge. You can do it totally for free. Keep your Visa card in your wallet. I don't care, just have a blast, do it for free. Get on the leaderboard, see how you shake out, have fun. When it comes up next year, check it out again. Of course, we're also gonna offer some cool pieces of swag. There'll be a t-shirt and a tank top that say linchpin test number three on it. And I think the other piece of swag that I'm waiting to receive in the mail to see if it's how I like is going to be just a, a dark colored sweatshirt, a hoodie sweatshirt, pullover sweatshirt that was kind of requested by a lot of people in the community. Cold months are coming in. And it's gonna be simple, understated, just over one of the uh, chest areas. It's just gonna have a linchpin. That's it. Just the linchpin on a dark sweatshirt. Good to go. So once that actually arrives, I'll show it on a video so everybody can check it out, but that's gonna be the other piece of swag. Linchpin test three is three rounds for time, 21 wall ball shots, 14 handstand push-ups, and seven deadlifts, 315 pounds for men, and 205 pounds for women. So once again, three rounds for time, 21 wall ball shots, 14 handstand push-ups, and seven deadlifts. 315 pounds for men, 205 for women. That's Lynchman test number three. You can find all of the tests on CrossFitLynchman.com and check that out there. There'll be a dumbbell version, there'll be a scaled version, and I'll make sure that there's a version that doesn't have handstand push-ups either. And I don't know whether I'll put in a, a shoulder press or something else because that will assume people need two barbells, which not everybody has. So I might just put in something else in there. Like a, I might just put in burpees each time in place of the 14 handstand push-ups. Yes, it's a little bit different. Yes, it's nowhere near of a strenuous press as handstand push-ups, but there are some people that just don't want to do handstand push-ups, that's okay. And doing 14 burpees per round, that's not gonna make the heavy deadlift feel any better. So you won't be shortchanged there. So I think it's gonna be either the third or fourth weekend in November. I'll let you know as we firm that up. I'm working with the BTWB team to make sure that we'll have everything in place uh, by one of those weekends. And when we solidify it, I'll let you know. Registration will begin the Monday prior. I'll share all of this on social media. I looked up this morning on the BTWB percentile. So if you're curious for the prescribed linchpin test three, 80th percentile, which is absolutely smashing it. It's about eight minutes. 60th percentile is right around 10 minutes. And 40th percentile is right around 1130. That gives you a rough idea of how long the workout's taking many people. Anywhere from eight minutes to 12 minutes ish. Don't need a video, it's just a fun community event. Like I said, we'll have RX scaled, dumbbell, the whole nine yards. And that's that, yeah, hopefully everybody enjoys it. And as these linchpin challenges and tests go on, and I don't expect, I don't expect anybody, you do whatever you want, um, but there's gonna be the whole range of lightweight to heavyweight, lower skill, to higher skill. And again, I'll always try to make a scaled version, but if you do these challenges, you're gonna find your limits somewhere. And that's a cool thing that hopefully you can uh, learn to overcome them. And as we all know, linchpin test 13 is looming in the future. 10 months from now, I guess, because we're on test three. So test 13 is looming. And if you don't know what test 13 is, you can go to the website and check it out. And I apologize in advance. So that's it. Enjoy your rest day. It's great linking back up with everybody. It was great seeing a whole bunch of linchpin people in person. And we'll talk later.